I do think people enjoy going to an event with a group of their friends and competing with that group against other teams, especially if they can do that in a kind of a level-based fair way. I had that as part of Duper, we had something called Minor League Pickleball, where you would pair up against other teams of equal, equal Duper scores and compete. And that's happening not only in America, but happening throughout the world now. Uh, throughout Asia, we're starting to see minor league events happen. Even if you lose, you're, you're going to have great stories of going with your friends and having a great time. I'm Paul Olson. I'm the host of the Future of Pickleball show on Selkirk TV. We have an interesting, interesting show today. Part of this show is going to be a major announcement that is going to rock the pickleball world. I want to welcome my two guests today, Mr. Amitabh Jain and Mr. Steve Kuhn. Welcome, gentlemen, to the show. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, uh, I believe I've got you two guys maybe in Hong Kong, China. Is that right? That is right, absolutely. And uh, and tell me, what are you what are you doing uh, in uh, what took you to Hong Kong at the moment? Maybe I'll take that. So, uh, so Paul, tomorrow uh, we have a Pickleball Minds Investor Summit. Uh, that's uh, first in the series under the Pickleball Minds uh, uh, brand, wherein uh, we would be talking about uh, investment opportunities in the world of pickleball. And uh, we wanted to kick this off with uh, uh, where else but uh, Asia and Hong Kong, uh, where uh, we are seeing that tremendous growth in pickleball. Uh, it's coming. It's there. So we thought we'll start and kick off with that. And that's the reason we are here. So tomorrow evening, which is September 20th, uh, Hong Kong time, uh, we are uh, going to have the first investor summit of Pickleball Mines. Very cool. Now, Steve, um... We know about you from a long, all of the adventures. I'll call them the adventures in pickleball with Steve Kuhn. <laughs> I, uh, I actually met Steve Kuhn a long time ago in Minnesota, of all places. He used yep. to come to my facility and, uh, and play pickleball with our group of hardcores. And I always was impressed with Steve. I would see him running out of the locker room, looking at his watch. I knew he had been setting his appointment schedule around pickleball. <laughs> And, and I was pretty impressed by that. But we had a lot of fun. Um, you know, something that, that a, a lot of people in the sport of pickleball know about Steve and what he had done with uh, creating the MLP, developing Duper as the preeminent um, uh, rating system in the sport, uh, an amazing facility he created in Dreamland in Austin, Texas. But one of the things that I don't think a lot of people have had a reason to know about Steve that's really important here is his business background. Steve is a Harvard grad. He came from a Goldman Sachs background. He led a very large, the Pine River Investment Fund in Minnesota, a $14 billion hedge fund, one of the most profitable on Wall Street. All of that leads into why we're doing this show today. Um, the, the announcement that you'll be making today about the World Pickleball Fund. Tell us about that, Steve. Well, well first of all, thank you, Paul. And uh, it has been a long and fun road together with you. Uh, always enjoyable to spend time with you. Always enjoyable to play with you uh, and talk with you. So thank you for the very kind words. And uh, I think if, if, if there's one thing that's kind of stitched together my life and my career is I love games. I love competition. Uh, I love... Uh, trying to find ways to make things more interesting and fun. Uh, and certainly working at a hedge fund is very, very much competition. It's definitely a game of sorts, a game that's uh, played for a significant amount of money. But at the end of the day, you know, thinking about how to use you know, strategy and uh, how to make it fun is actually part of 
making that a successful venture as well. And uh, af af after I left finance, I, I fell in love with this sport, uh, partly by playing with you and by playing with other amazingly fun people. And uh, I made it my goal to hopefully uh, find successful ventures, uh, successful investment ventures for myself, successful investors uh, ventures for my investors, but also Another one of my goals, which which uh, I've always been sh sharing, is I want to bring more people to the sport. I think the sport makes people's lives better, makes them happier. Uh, we talked about a 40 by 30 initiative in the early days of MLP, which uh, actually seems kind of you know, quaint now. Uh, we said 40 million players by, by 2030. You know, uh, I think a, a lot of different estimates, including some more work done, I think recently by the APP, says that not only have we hit 40 million, but we've already passed that and we're only in 2024. Uh, I think that that's testament to what an amazing sport this is, how it, it's, it's fun from the first minute you play and it gets more fun as you get to know more people in it. It, it starts to just become a part of everyone's lives and brings families together and bring, it creates new friends. And we think that uh, uh, working with Amitabh here, we think that that same uh, adventure and that same coming together of people uh, is, is happening already in Asia and will continue to do so. And we, we see that there's going to be amazing opportunities to, uh, to not only bring joy to millions and millions of people, hopefully tens of millions or maybe even hundreds of millions of people by, creating, by bringing the sport to people, but there will also be good investment opportunities as well. Hi, I want to tell you guys about one of the best additions I've got to my game, and it's not another paddle. It's not another shirt, it's my Selkirk Tour Bag. Selkirk bags are designed with tremendous intent. They're to help you organize, to keep things that you need with you where you can get at them whenever you want them. The beauty of the Selkirk bags is they're designed by a company that really thinks first, last, and always about pickleball. They've created a series of bags at all kinds of price points that are tremendously well designed, and frankly, they look really good. Look at the Selkirk bags, not only for what you do courtside, I use my tour bag as my travel bag when I'm going around the country. Selkirk will help you have the best experience you can have. Enjoy it. Thanks so much. You can find all the bags on Selkirk.com's website. Well, Amitabh, tell me, now you guys have formed the World Pickleball Ventures. Guide me a little bit as to what you're seeing in the world and where the opportunities might be coming for people like yourselves and other people who are accredited investors that might be interested in becoming involved. Tell us about World Pickleball Ventures. Yeah, so uh, Paul, as Steve mentioned, uh, the kind of opportunity that we are seeing uh, uh, in Asia and across the world. So we have a reference point from the US. We have seen the kind of growth that has happened in the last three to four years. And if we have to just uh, uh, draw an analogy or use that as a reference, uh, uh, and let's say there will be three to four or five years from now, there will be about eight to 10 times growth in terms of number of players. What yeah. that means is okay. there will be a corresponding opportunity in the business world as well, uh, which could be in, uh, let's say, hundreds of millions of dollars if we have to just extrapolate. So that's the kind of opportunity base uh, that we are uh, seeing. Uh, just in Asia, and that is something that could get replicated across uh, some of the other regions as well. And uh, it's important and it's uh, uh, it's it's kind of uh, uh, important for anybody and for us for that matter to be able to tap into the right opportunities and uh, to get uh, the right group of accredited uh, investors together so that this kind of a growth can be fueled and funded in an organized manner. So that's what we are intending to do as we uh, move forward. And this is just the first step towards that. Very nice. You know, one of the things that I find very interesting where I've been around the pickleball space a long time to imagine looking back five years ago and thinking of what could the what could the opportunities have been if somebody had been able to identify the opportunities, financial uh, things that growing in the sport of pickleball. So the idea of being able to take a first mover position in Asia just strikes me as being a, a, an absolute winner of an opportunity. Very, very cool indeed. 
you know, something I found in terms of researching um, uh, the topics for today's conversation is I saw that your primary focuses seem to be on facilities, media and content, sports technologies. Tell me about how an investor group will look at um, pursuing those segments of the marketplace. Yeah, so uh, just just this evening, I was uh, lucky enough to attend the opening of the first indoor pickleball court in Hong Kong. Uh, the opening the opening party was this evening, and uh, it's a really nice, really beautiful facility, really fun. Uh, I would say it's more of kind of the that entertainment type model. It's the yeah. if, if you know what I mean. Uh, obviously, several companies, uh, chicken and pickle, probably being first and foremost uh, among them, uh, at least. Have kind of laid that ground in the United States, and I think this is following in that in that footsteps. Um, and it's it's just exciting to see. And yeah, we uh, yeah there there are 400 million people in U.S. and Canada combined, roughly. Uh, if you want to include our friends in, in Mexico, it's a little bit more than that. But there's you know roughly four billion people in Asia, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah, so you can see yeah you know, the scale of the opportunity here is 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 incredible. And I think that means that you know, that there will be opportunities to do, you know, to to look at uh, all kinds of different ways to find, you know, hopefully talented partners, talented local partners, uh, in markets across Asia, who are you know, who are really connecting to you know to, to players and the in the new markets. I think that's the way that you really want to you know find find good opportunities is you want to find people who understand the local market, who understand the local uh, culture laws, uh, all the other things that you have to be careful about uh, and, and, and find ways to partner with them. You know, it's so interesting as I think of, of uh, in Asia, particularly coming into the pickleball space and where it strikes me that the Asian culture is so oriented, currently oriented to paddle and racket sports, yeah. that the idea, I've often said that the, I thought that when the table tennis players and the badminton players start to come into the game, we may see a whole nother dynamic start to come because of the quickness and speed of that. Amitabh, do you think I'm on the right track? Oh, you are. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, table tennis, badminton is in every street, every corner uh, in most of the Asian countries. Uh, uh, I think the proliferation is actually from a concentration point of view, more than what we see of tennis in the US. So if I have to, again, uh, draw an analogy and say, okay, if the number of people who are going to play this would be, let's say, 10 times of what we have seen in the past. And if you look at uh, the unique characteristics that the sport has, which is which is what makes it addictive, and it has opened a completely new market segment, uh, uh, so to say, of uh, the people who were otherwise not very uh, agile to play some of the other sports, plus the kind of age group and the segment and the demographics. So it's a completely additionally new segment that has been opened by the sport. Uh, so if we have to use some of the numbers in terms of the number of people playing, the sport being addictive, everybody spending X number of dollars on a weekly basis or a daily basis on the sport, if we convert that into some kind of a calculation of the target uh, uh, market. We are talking about at least uh, nine uh, figure uh, numbers here. So that's the kind of market opportunity that we are seeing uh, or uh, can be projected in next few years could be a few hundred uh, uh, billion dollars. You know, it is, it's, it's very interesting for me as I, I get a chance, I've had an uh, opportunity to talk to a number of, of leaders from around the world as to what they're seeing in their respective markets. And one of the things that I see without exception seems to be that many of the characteristics of pickleball in America that made it successful, primarily in the health and wellness side of things, seem to be translating very well to the Asian markets. And um, are you finding that same thing? Yep, and uh, so there's something, uh, what I call as the four A's of pickleball. Uh, what I mean by that is, anywhere anyone can play anywhere anytime with anybody so a a a a four <laughs> a's of pickleball and that is something which has uh, got a global appeal so there are some things which have a uh, regional demographic or cultural appeal but there are a few things which are beyond uh, such restrictions and i think pickleball is on the top of that list in the beyond such restrictions so the four a's are applicable globally 
to any place on this globe. Steve, I know uh, from having known you a long time and now that I know AJ as well, both of you come from very substantial IT technology backgrounds and interests in the sport. How do you see that factoring into um, the global blow up of pickleball? Yeah, well, I think uh, you know, what, one thing you see in, uh, in Asian cultures is it, it, as, as addicted as we are to social media, I think that, 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 same, that same addiction is here as well. And you see uh, a lot of people using phones, interacting with phones. Uh, if, if anything, that, that, you know, that, connection, that, connection, that connection to technology and, and viewing content is, is very strong here. It's a, it, I'd say at least as strong as the U.S., uh, which is which is saying a lot. It's, it's awfully strong in the U.S. And I think you know, as this sport grows, it's going to need to make sure that it, it connects to those audiences by by creating in, in, interesting and innovative content. Because I think that's that's how you know, that's how we're going to spread the word about this sport and, and build the kind of the get the snowball rolling downhill in terms of creating you know, more more interest. More then that means that we'll have more venues being constructed. That means, yeah, all the things that, that we've seen, more tournaments, all these things are happening in Asia. All, But yeah, as the snowball starts rolling downhill, it actually starts to connect even more and more snow. And I think a, a, a focus on creating good content that is watched by you know, the, the billions of people in these markets uh, will be important. You know, as we talk about this, I, uh, I know there's been some, some signals coming out of Asia that the talent pool that may be available might be quite remarkable. And on your website, I noticed that talent development was something that was a piece that you guys are paying attention to. Stephen, tell me about how, how you see it from an American's perspective, how the Asians will come into the global scene. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, this is a fun question. And the one I, I certainly don't know the answer to, I'm not sure anybody does, but I talk often about uh, three sports that were all invented in England, table tennis, badminton, and squash. Uh, and if you look at the earliest days, so the first you know, 50 years of those sports, uh, a, 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 a high percentage of the world champions came from England, or they certainly came from you know, England or, or adjacent countries to England, you know, France, you know, et cetera. Uh, if you look at the, the next years after that, uh, in, in many of these sports, they became dominated by players from from Asia. Uh, and the question is, <laughs> one thing that's, 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 that's fun, a fun question to ask people uh, in this part of the world is, where was table tennis invented? And you know, almost everyone, almost everyone in China will say China. The, the idea that it wasn't invented in China is, is uh, strikes them as, uh, is, is odd. Yet, will it ever get to the point where, where pickleball is uh, so strong in Asia that, that they, they won't remember was invented? I, I don't think so. I don't think that's the likely scenario. But a, a, a more interesting version of, of the question is, at, at what point will you know, players from uh, not only Asia but other other parts of the world, how how quickly will they, will they rise up the ranks of? Obviously, we have international players already. We have you have know, yeah, yeah we have we have uh, all, you know, a lot of players in, in MLP are international already, so that's already happened. But most of them, most of them, came to the U.S. for college and played college tennis. That's probably how. But you know, players who were, were born and raised in these countries becoming top players, it's starting to happen, or obviously, but that will happen more. And it'll be interesting to see uh, the pace of that uh, and whether that happens. Uh, in, in there's other sports, it took decades. It took a long, a long time for the other sports to really, but at, at some point it really, it transitioned where Asian countries really became the more dominant forces. W watching that, uh, watching that dynamic across the world will be incredibly intriguing. I, I, don't, I don't know how that will play out and at what timeline that that uh, that will play out. Well, you know, it's it, it's interesting having been a, a pretty strong follower of this game for a long time. When when I look at how the sport grew organically in America, it was really a grassroots effort that one thing led to another. But now that the world and people like yourselves are able to look at the case study that is pickleball in America or pickleball in North America, it makes it a pretty easy thing to identify as, wow, if this happens globally, the numbers are just insane. And that yeah. 
40 by 30 number that was thrown around just a couple years ago may very well start to talk about hundreds of millions of people sure. around the world playing this game. And that's very, very exciting stuff. I want to just take a quick moment and let you, if you're watching this, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, watch us. You're seeing people, some of the leaders of the industry sit on my show with me talking about where the sport is going and how it's going to get there. And I want to thank Selkirk TV for hosting my show. This gives me a tremendous opportunity to talk to the people who are really making a difference in the sport. What I'd like to do if I could with you guys is I want to just kind of jump ahead a little bit. Um, you're at the Hong Kong Investor Conference right now. Um, in just a couple of months, we're all going to be in Dubai for the Pickleball Minds Conference in Dubai. AJ, tell us a little bit about what you think will happen in Dubai in January. So uh, what we'll be doing in Dubai would be a step ahead and step forward from what we did in Princeton. So we have a reference point. We have a benchmark. Uh, as, uh, as you know, Paul, uh, Pickleball Minds, uh, we are planning to create this as a, the Davos of Pickleball, which is the most prestigious and the elite conference that people would like to get associated with in the world of Pickleball and the industry of Pickleball. Uh, Dubai presents another opportunity to attract uh, the global audience uh, who is getting interested in the business of pickleball and they all coming together in collaborating and partnering and learning from each other. Uh, this will be a very similar format to what we had in Princeton one day, multiple panel discussions, getting the best of the minds uh, of the industry together in a small and a, uh, call it a cozy environment. This is not a trade show on an expo or an expo, as you know. So that's what we'll be doing in January in Dubai as well. You know, as, as we talk about these kind of conferences, I think it's important for people to realize, um, and I say people, the, the serious people in the sport of pickleball that are trying to get involved and help them make, a, make things happen and make a difference. When I met Amitab and heard about his concept of a serious business leaders meeting other business leaders, that was the environment that I flourished in in my business world. That's that's where senior executives want to meet other senior executives. Other kinds of events, they'll generally send somebody from their staff to attend. Pickleball Minds could very well be the next triggering point in my mind. I think with what you guys are doing today in the announcement of your new fund globally in Hong Kong, and then what's going to happen in Dubai in just a couple months, I wonder if two or three years from now, we won't be looking back at these events and saying this was the triggering point, the next big leap in pickleball. And I think that's pretty darn exciting stuff. Um, you know, what I'd like to do, Steve, if you would, um, I just want to go back in the, the adventures of Steve to the original MLP event in Dripping Springs at, at Dreamland. Um, I was fortunate to be there. That was one of the most amazing events I think that's ever been done in Pickleball. It, it's a shame that people can't even have experienced what that event was like. You're smiling. You you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, uh, uh, I sat there in that event, stamping my feet on those aluminum bleachers. The whole place was going nuts with Randy Hately drinking margaritas by the boatload, and we had fun. Tell us a little bit about how you see the team game being a factor globally. Yeah, I do think people enjoy going to an event with a group of their friends and competing with that group against other teams, especially if they can do that in a kind of a level-based fair way. I think it's really, really fun. Obviously, uh, we, we had that as part of Duper. We had something called Minor League Pickleball where you would pair up against other teams of equal equal duper scores and compete. And that's happening not only in America, but happening throughout the world now. Uh, throughout Asia, we're starting to see minor league events happen. There's one scheduled here for Hong Kong uh, later this year. Uh, and I think that that's, that's yeah, I think it's really fun. It, it, even if you lose, you're, you're going to have great stories of going with your friends and having a great time. And, uh, yeah, and I think that that's a format that I hope to see, see continue to grow. One thing that Amitabh and I are working on is uh, creating some club competitions in every country in Asia. 
where pickleball clubs would would sign up with us to uh, to create a, a basically a mini amateur competition in their countries, uh, and we'd put teams together and have them compete. And say groups of four, four teams in, yeah, whether you know, let's pick a let's pick a city, uh, yeah, in Manila in the Philippines would come together. They would they and they would they would each compete against each other. Each one of them would host an event, uh, and the other three teams would come. You play three matches that day, uh, and you would do that at all four venues. So a twelve game season over a couple of months, with, and uh, and with the, that winner being the kind of the the winner of that city or the winner of that country, I think people will uh, these clubs I think will really enjoy it. And again, this is a this is an amateur competition. This isn't building a new pro league, but I think it's what we talk about in, in hosting and creating this idea, which we call the Pickleball Champions League of Asia, Pickleball Champions League Asia is focusing on creating joy, creating something that's really, really fun for the players to play in. Uh, there's nothing like playing with your friends and competing against other clubs. We hope when, when these events happen at each club, it's a big party, that their, their fans and friends, friends will come, up, come and cheer them on, that the competing teams will bring some people to cheer for them as well. Uh, and I think this is just a great way to, to kind of build up some great content in the sport, build up attention for the sport across various countries in Asia. And, and frankly, not every club team will be as good as the other. Uh, yeah, this isn't meant to be, yeah, yeah. And not every countries will have the same yeah. stake as other countries, and, but that's okay. Uh, this is meant to be fun. It's meant to be joyful. Uh, and we're, we're really excited about, uh, about launching what we call the Pickleball Champions League of Asia. And what we're going to do is we're going to find great partners in every country who will help us select clubs who uh, who will help will organize this and will care about it. We're not asking for any money from the clubs. Uh, we're just asking for them to care, to create, you know, talk about, cre create a great atmosphere for the teams that visit them, make it a fun event for them, uh, make it so that you know, if you can get some content from social media so that other people can start to see what's going on. Uh, this is just a, a, a great amateur event that we think will will bring a lot of attention to pickleball and bring more people into the sport. And yeah. uh, that's another that's thing, something we're going to be yeah. announcing. You're getting a preview. We're going to be announcing this more formally tomorrow at the Pickleball Minds Conference here in, in Hong Kong. Yeah. So you're getting a scoop. You're getting a scoop, Paul. <laughs> Very nice. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, on that note, I had a man named Greg Mather on my show some time ago, and Greg runs the uh, uh, Apple League in Phoenix, Arizona, or in Arizona, that has 5,000 players competing yeah. in it in the state of Arizona. It's unlike anything that's being done anywhere else in the U.S., but it's exactly what you're describing. It's about yeah. the team and the fun, and most of it, or often, it's about the party after the event. And exactly. so very, very cool indeed. Very just, cool indeed. Just, just to add to that, uh, uh, so the kind of organic growth uh, that we are foreseeing with such kind of initiatives and uh, uh, the competitions which are more fun oriented, participation oriented, joy oriented, I think there is going to be a tremendous uh, uh, bottom line or the organic growth that will happen in the sport with these kind of events. I'll tell you what, I, you guys get me so excited thinking about these things. Uh, every time I turn around, we're, we've talked about where the sport has come from and we think where it's going and 40 by 30 happens a whole lot faster than by 30. Um, the, the, the idea, what I'd like to end up, if I could get both of you to just individually give me your thoughts on what you see happening on the global scene um, Amitabh, let's start with you. Over the next three to five years, what do you see happening in the pickleball world? I, I always like that question from you, Paul. I know you always ask that question. <laughs> and one of the parts of my answer is whatever I can foresee or foresee in three to five years generally happens in two years in the pickleball world. So I think that's <laughs> going to happen at a global level as well. We've seen that happening in the US. Uh, so if you're talking about, say, 100 million players or 200 million players in, let's say, three to five years, I'll not be surprised if that happens in less than that time. So that's on the number of players side. And uh, as we know, this is addictive. Uh, this is a good addiction to have. 
<laughs> and uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is a good analogy, but I'll use that and maybe you can cut it out after <laughs> the editing if, if that doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, this industry is going to be bigger than the cigarette industry. People spend on it on a daily and a weekly basis. And uh, the kind of spend that we see in the US, of course, the purchasing power might be lesser in some other countries and continents, but the kind of addiction and the daily and the weekly spend on this corresponds to a lot uh, bigger market that we're talking about. So that would be my uh, uh, few sentences, a few closing comments. All right. All right. Now, before Steve Kuhn answers, and of course, Steve Kuhn comes with an awful lot of history from a lot of different angles in the sport. Ignore what AJ just said, and I want the pure, unfiltered Steve Kuhn's perspective on the next three to five years. Well, let me answer the question this way: Is yeah, I, I, I really hope that the sport of pickleball is something that it, it obviously brings people together locally. It brings families together. It brings it creates new friendship bonds. Yeah, uh, it, it really brings communities together. But my my hope and I don't know how this will will be, and I don't, and I definitely could see that it could go either way. Is that uh, that pickleball is something that brings various countries together as well, uh, and uh, I, I I fear yeah yeah we 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 live in an age where there's a lot of there's certainly a lot of tension uh, among countries in general, and a lot of country tension between countries in Asia, uh, and I I hope that that is something that we can not feel in, in the sport of pickleball. Um, you know, uh, other sports, in a recent example, other sports uh, have sometimes not allowed players from, say, Russia to play in their events uh, because of, you know, be, because of actions that, you know, that, that were you know, viewed as, you know, not, not correct by that country. I, uh, I'm trying to be as apolitical as I possibly can be in, in saying things, but I, I, I hope pickleball does not go down that path in any way. I hope we view the people who view the sports as, as, as individuals and people that we learn to be, become friends with. And I hope in some ways that pickleball can be a bridge between countries. Yeah, we, we, uh, some of us who are you know, a little bit older remember the idea and the phrase of ping pong diplomacy that happened in the 1970s between the U.S. and China. Uh, that was a time of that in what seemingly is a very small way, kind of you know, sport of playing ping pong together, it can't really, how did that matter? But I actually think you know, things like that do matter. Uh, they remind us that no matter where, where people are from, they are human beings as well. And they, uh, they could be a joyful part of our lives as well if we get to know them. And I hope pickleball is a, a force for, you know, that kind of bringing together of people, not only within communities, not only within families, but across country lines as well. Because, you know, uh, I, I think that would be, you know, of all the great things that this sport is doing for, to make people happier, healthier, live longer, all the things that we, 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 we all talk about and, and are aware of, if this was also a force for you know, bringing countries together and making the chance of you know, conflict between countries or tension between countries, if, if that could be reduced through this sport. And perhaps perhaps that view and, and that potential idea is maybe that borders on the naive, perhaps. I, I, I hope not. I hope that there is some possibility in that and some truth in that that we can actually, uh, that we can realize through this sport in a way that would make the sport special yet again. If we can, if we can do that, so I, you know, my 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 call to people in the pickleball world, no matter what country you're in, is let's let's try not to let you know any potential you know stress or conflict between countries stop us from you know, finding new friends in all, in all countries across the world who who love this who share our love for this sport. There's a yeah, you know, there's a an African phrase, yeah, you know, when the when the elephants fight. The grass gets uh, the grass gets injured, yeah. Uh, we need to reverse that. You know, we we, we need to find a ways to uh, to to help the elephants fight less. Uh, and so, again, perhaps that's a, a, a bit a bit okay. naive, but it's my uh, nonetheless. Uh, I, I'm going to try and put that idea out to the world. 
You, you know, I, I'll tell you, it, I don't think it's naive at all. There was an experience that I had on this show. I had a man named Roger Belair on, who is the head of growing pickleball in the prison systems in America. And yeah. one of the things that Roger had said is why the wardens and, and his programs blowing up in an environment, yeah. where do we hear anything positive about the prison systems? Pickleball is becoming a factor. And Roger said that one of the phenomenons that they were seeing is it's the only space in the prison where opposing gang members are will talk to each other and sometimes even partner together because of pickleball. And you go, that seems almost silly, but it's actually happening. And when you have the U.S. prison system wardens promoting the game to other wardens, Rogers, he's hustling to just find enough volunteers to help integrate this into the number of of prisons that want to add it. But it's doing exactly what you're describing on a on a micro level. There'd be no reason in the world that it can't happen at a macro level. Gentlemen, I want to say thank you so much. This has been such a great interview. Um, I I, uh, got up a little early to meet with you guys while you're in Hong Kong and I'm in America. But uh, but we're going to fix that again in the future. I look forward to seeing both of you in the not too distant future. Good night, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being on the show. 